Thank you for those previous panel members. Now I'll introduce uh, this, this panel conversation is about indig Indigenous language materials and co-design process. And the panel members will be Clint Bracknell, University of Queensland, Des Crump, University of Queensland, Nick Thyberger, University of Melbourne, Bo Williams, First Languages Australia, Kristen Thorpe, UTS Jambana Institute for Indigenous Education and Research, and Lauren Booker, UTS Jumbaka. So, proceed. Clint should be first. I just dropped my boy off at kindy, so I'm just coming into this very fresh. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I guess probably to, to frame this, I could probably give some examples from back west where I'm from. I'm Nyunga from the south coast of Western Australia. And in terms of working with language material, I come at it from the arts space, the creative arts space, as a, a musician and then a music educator. I sort of got drawn to this space because of the idea, I guess, that languages can be the wellspring for Indigenous creativity. When we have these forces that seek to limit people's ability to express themselves, to express emotion, to express feeling, to express knowledge, um, I think a lot of that comes down to limiting language. So in the south of Western Australia, from where I'm from, language, has been, language use has been impacted for a very long time. Um, and in terms of, I guess, reinvigorating or tapping anew that wellspring for creativity, language has been a big part of what's gone on in the Noongar region for a long time, since at least the 1970s, after a lot of those uh, more draconian uh, policies had been uh, shifted or started to shift. So in terms of language data, in that region where I'm from, the language is still around. You see it in place names, people use it in everyday speech, but not speaking it right through. You know, it's peppered throughout English. And then when it comes to these big arts projects that I've been part of, and I say part of because it's not me leading, it's me part of a big team. If we didn't have the deep reservoir of language material to draw on, then those projects would not, as, not be as effective as what they have been. So we did a um, Noongar version of Shakespeare's Macbeth that involved over 10 uh, Noongar actors over about, about a decade of work in terms of building up everyone's confidence to be able to do Noongar straight out uh, for about an hour and a half on stage, um, uninterrupted by English. Quite a tricky thing to do in a place like Perth and took a long time. And if we didn't have all that language data to draw on, and there's more language data that exists that we weren't able to draw on because of those issues around uh, copyright and all this other stuff. But because the language was so, I wouldn't say well documented, but um, because there were so many sources to look at, we were able to triangulate um, our selection of vocabulary when responding to a challenge like that. How to take Shakespeare in English with all of its many words and Shakespeare even invented words, like I think he invented the word bubble. So bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. Luckily there's a Noongar word for bubble too. <laughs> so we got there before English. Um, but in that process, because you're dealing with a language that's like a corpus that's so great in Shakespeare in English, and then we've got this corpus that's quite small, like the Noongar Dictionary that was um, come out in 1992. I think Nick was part of that, at least the stuff that led up to that. Um, it's quite a small word list. And people like Gina Williams um, back home who's doing albums of um, contemporary music in Noongar and it, they've been drawing on this quite small word list. So when we're trying to do a big project like a Macbeth in Noongar, I got together all of these different word lists that I could find. 
We've got this big spreadsheet. Lauren Booker, who's on the call, helped me compile it. Um, and Amy Budrikas, who's back home, who's a linguist, um, sort of took that process over. And it was only because we had all that data to draw on, we were able to then take that to our community reference group of language speakers and talk through if we need to come up with a word or a word that's fallen out of use, get all the evidence together, look at it together, and then move ahead. And then through that process of using just the words, we've now got a big document, this Nyungara Macbeth, which everyone's able to use in the community and has informed other arts projects, including the Fist of Fury in Nyungara Da, the Bruce Lee film. So there we're able to go from Cantonese to Nyungara using a similar process of cross-referencing. But it's only because we've got that wellspring of data that we're able to have those conversations. Because otherwise, the work wouldn't be as deep. The well wouldn't be as deep. So if we get this right, if people have greater access to their language data, all sorts of things can happen, but it needs to be a community-informed process and it needs to be about everyone doing it together not just um, one or two people sort of blazing ahead and, and leaving everyone in a trail of dust. I've been told to stop, so I'll stop. The, um, <laughs> shortly after that, I, uh, rather than have a midlife crisis, I thought I'd leave the education department and set up my own consultancy to work with uh, languages, particularly in southwest Queensland, where languages are no longer spoken, or, or very few people have that language knowledge. So it was important to um, build up my knowledge and understanding, So, I, I, because there's a lot of jargon around uh, linguistic documents. Nothing against linguists, there's a lot of great linguists out there, but there's those, those barriers that come up in terms of accessibility for our community language workers, our community members wanting to access collections, whether they be in libraries, archives, IATSIS or so on. So the masters at least gave me that little bit of an introduction to linguistics so that it could help interpret and um, repurpose that information that a linguist has collected into a, a more meaningful, uh, useful way that uh, community can understand and pick it up. Then uh, Louise, thanks for the shout out before for State Library, uh, with um, my role there as Indigenous Languages uh, Coordinator and um, a lot of research. But the most rewarding part was, uh, as Louise said, bringing community in to engage with those collections because unless people are using those collections, they're just items gathering dust in a, in a collection on an archive somewhere. So it was a very much a, a, a rapid learning journey because um, Libraries were places where people find information. Language information is not always that easy to find. So one of the first workshops, we had a group there from North Queensland. They said, oh, you haven't got much on durable language here. And I said, oh, yeah, we've got a fair bit. I'll put some out for you there. And, oh, I can't find any of Uncle Ernie's stuff. And I said, oh, well, I know we've got Uncle Ernie's stuff here. And then I thought, hang on, how have you spelt durable? Because unless they spelt durable in seven different ways, they didn't find the 48 items that we had in the collection regarding durable language. So we didn't want our communities to have to pass a spelling test to access collections. So, how, so there's another access barrier. So I thought, well, how do we, how do we um, make things more discoverable without that spelling component in it? And fortunately, IATSIS and Auslang have the language codes. So now if you, if you type in hopefully one of those seven different ways uh, into the OneSearch catalogue at the State Library, you'll come up with an item, or, or several items, and then you'll see a language code, I access language code Y123. Click on that, boom, up comes the other 48 items around collections. And so fortunately, um, a lot of the other collecting institutions, certainly I access, but um, national libraries, state libraries across the, uh, the nation have all um, identified that because how we describe languages 
isn't necessarily how uh, language community describe it, how uh, linguists describe it, doesn't always match up with the terminology that community use. So how, how can we describe items in our catalogue, whether it's at the archives, at the state library, so that community can find the information they need? And touching on the, uh, the, the trauma, we um, had a couple of uh, exhibitions and uh, research activities in at the state library that, that trigger that because you don't want to um, trigger trauma by having um, by opening up the collections there needs to be some sort of um, opportunity there's space to to reflect on that and we're working on that at the archives and certainly with Rose and and the language team there we found 70 items so far or 70 languages sorry in the collection so far and but it's it's very much described at that agency level and so there's information there that isn't um, for example, I was going through some items, mostly language stuff, just bits and pieces of words, word lists here and there, then all of a sudden I see this familiar name. And I thought, oh, hang on, is that my great auntie they're talking about or my great auntie's daughter? And it was just this random piece of paper tucked away in a collection item. It had nothing to do with the rest of the collection item and it was describing my, uh, my um, great aunt's uh, sister-in-law, actually, um, whom I other great aunt was named after and she's a 14 year old girl living on a property out the back of St George and they're making an observation about her moral state and her uh, whether she's in a in a safe space so imagine so I'm, I was only sort of connected in a in a roundabout sort of way to that so we have to be really mindful those with that information that that is found how how do we make it a safe space for our communities when they're finding that information and using it and I'll stop there. G'day everyone. Uh, my name's Bo. I'm a Murrawari man um, from, well, I usually, I'm, I'm from New South Wales, so I usually describe it as northwest New South Wales heading into Queensland. But, you know, I'm in Queensland, so it's, it's southwest Queensland heading into uh, New South Wales, but, but reflecting on you know, that first session this morning, um, I guess the state border really is a, a legal fiction in some ways, and it's just another way um, that we are sort of forced to define ourselves, uh, and we really need to sometimes, you know, myself as an Aboriginal person, um, go away and rethink um, you know, the, the systems that, that I'm entrenched in as well. Um, so it's, it's a it's a powerful thing to, to hear that uh, this morning. Um, so I'm a Murawari man. I also work with an organisation called First Languages Australia. So we're the peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. So we support the work that's being done by a network of Indigenous language centres across the country, uh, work that's being done by small community organisations and individuals and community groups uh, who are working locally on their own languages. Last week, I was talking at an event in a town, the town of Parks in Central West New South Wales. And I was there for the opening of the Wiradjuri Nurembang exhibition. It's a small permanent exhibition consisting of a couple of glass cabinets in the council building, which also houses the local library and the, a small art gallery. Um, the exhibition also has a digital element, an online presence with some videos, pictures uh, and text. The exhibition came about because some truly amazing artefacts had been uncovered in old boxes in the local museum. From there, a group of motivated people from the local Aboriginal community worked to find the artefacts an appropriate new home where they'd received the respect they deserved and would be available for everyone to see and learn about. So reflecting on my conversations I had last week with those people involved and what I'd seen, there's three things that stood out to me uh, that I want to briefly mention here. First, the work was led by a committee made up of local Aboriginal community members, including Wiradjuri knowledge holders, and was supported by the, the local council library and cultural services manager and a museum consultant. Having the right structure with the right people ensured that the work that was done was done within the correct cultural structures and it aligned with the existing structures that were there, like the local elders group. 
uh, Indigenous governance is and leadership is key in this space. Uh, it's the foundation that we need to work from, so it's the first thing we need to think about and get right before we even start work. And it's something we need to continue to think about and refresh and rethink as we go along. Secondly, the committee all had stories to tell me about how laborious some of the meetings they had were, getting down into the minute details. Uh, they, they had meetings about what fonts to use, about the exact wording or, um, and which objects should go on which side of the cabinet and exactly how long the, the video should go for. But the detail is important. It was through these dis discussions that key decisions were made. Uh, things like deciding to put the Wiradjuri word first in bold, big text and then having the English word and the description after it to really highlight the Wiradjuri word. So the work needs to be done in the right way with enough time and effort given to ensure that those little details come together because in the end, those little details are just so important. And thirdly and finally, um, everyone that I spoke to on the day was obviously really happy with the outcome. Um, it's important to keep in mind the outcome as we go along. When we've got a little project like that, it's very easy to see what that outcome is. When we've got something big, um, much larger and much more abstract, like the Language Data Commons of Australia, it can sometimes be a lot harder to articulate that. So to that last point, when it comes to Indigenous language data, what we're talking about here, why are we doing this? What's the point of the Language Data Commons of Australia or working to make the data more accessible? For me, I want to see a future where all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can learn their language, can speak their language, and can use their language however they want to. Uh, if a academics access and use the data in line with culturally safe access principles, of course, then that's great. Uh, but for me, the goal is unlocking that information so that the language can be spoken. Can anyone hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah. Hey. Okay, so we had some slides to show just because we're co-presenting. Are they is it possible to put them up? But it's okay if not. Okay, because we can't hear anyone, what we might do is just get stuck into it. <laughs> uh, so thanks for um, connecting us online today. It would have been great to be in the room. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the land of the Darkenjung people, the Central Coast, and um, acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room. Uh, my name is Kirsten Thorpe. Lauren and I are going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing at Jambana Research this morning um, briefly. And I guess in the same way that Sandra had done this morning, um, share a few things that we're thinking about in terms of that work. Um, my family are Waramai people from Port Stephens um, in New South Wales. So I always, also want to acknowledge my family connections to that area. Um, so Lauren and I are part of the Indigenous Archives and Data Stewardship Hub at Jambana Research at UTS. And I guess one of the things that we bring to this conversation is having come from practice of working in GLAM broadly over the past couple of decades, um, 
have now turned to research because we've seen the failure of the systems and structures of GLAM in supporting Indigenous people's sovereignty and self-determination. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is how we can conceptualise and theorise as well as look at practically how um, the work hits the ground in terms of supporting um, the management of Indigenous knowledges, but also looking at how communities can have greater access to the archives. Um, one of the things that we talk about constantly is um, the need for the work to be obviously relational, but also to call out um, practices that are extractive. And I think one of the challenges in the data space with um, working with languages is there's often a real desire for people to consume and um, use material, but um, people also aren't looking at how communities are um, nurtured and fulfilled. And I think that's come up a little bit in the conversations, um, talking about trauma-informed approaches. And I guess one thing before I hand over to Lauren um, that we're also thinking about is how recognition of um, a lot of the approaches that are taking place at the moment still support the work of the nation state and they're still being funded by federal and state governments in a way that actually doesn't hit the ground. Um, and Lauren's going to talk about um, that in reflection of some of the things um, that we're doing. So um, one of the things that we would argue is that you know, unless we unravel those processes and start to call attention, as Sandra did earlier, to the fact that we're um, living and working on stolen land is that we are still supporting the Australian colonial project um, if we don't truly refocus our work to support communities. So I'm going to hand over to Lauren to sort of touch on some of the key themes that we were thinking about. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, hi everyone, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, um, which is where I'm calling in from, um, unceded, um, unceded Gadigal land, um, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, thanks again um, for having us here online, we're really, um, our apologies, we can't be there in person, I'd, I'd much prefer to be there in person and, and chat with you all. Um, so my name's uh, Lauren. I work with Kirsten in the Indigenous uh, Archives and Data Stewardship team. Um, I'm also doing my PhD at UTS through John Bonner at the moment. Um, and my family, uh, Garigal clan through my mother and Japanese um, from Nagasaki Prefecture through my, through my father. And so Kirsten just kind of set up what some of the, the, the priorities and, the, and uh, the focuses that we have at our, um, at our hub, a um, uh, small hub that's based within John, John Bonner Research Unit. Um, and I just want to expand on a couple of those, of those things. I mean, I think one thing within the, the previous panel that I started to think about is, um, and through some of the questions that I guess we're going to be discussing in this panel is, um, what are we referring to when we think about and we talk about Indigenous data. Um, and I just wanted to take, um, and, sorry, um, I just want to share the, the quote, a quote from the Mayim Nairi Wingara Data Sovereignty, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective, Maggie Walter's work, um, where they refer to Indigenous data as referring to information or knowledge in any format or any medium, which is about or may affect Indigenous peoples, both collectively and uh, individually. And I just thought it was, um, important to, to kind of state that because as we've um, so some of us have, have have mentioned you know when we start to talk about things like collections and records and information and data you know it kind of it can spiral out um, but we, you know when Kirsten and I are speaking of this we're speaking in, in uh, speaking of data or, or knowledge or information collections in a holistic way it's um, it's 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 inclusive of all things um, that that are the um, the 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 knowledge of and the stories of um, and the information of Indigenous peoples, um, whether it's written by them or about them, it's still it's encompassed in that in that description. Um, so some of the the, the priorities um, that that drive uh, the multiple projects and the partnerships that we have um, through our hub, uh, we uh, have a focus on. Um, uh, increasing and supporting and advocating for Indigenous rights and records and, and some of those uh, those rights include for us it's the, the paramount right to know um, and also the right of reply for communities to records but the right to know um, we we consistently come back to to both in Kirsten and my in my work um, 
around how it, the imperative for institutions to proactively disclose the collections and the records and the information that they, that they hold, you know, everything is that is such a important step uh, that so many other things that we talk about cannot happen without that uh, imperative taking place. Um, we also focus a lot on findability and accessibility and usability of collections that are held in GLAM, but we, we focus on that with the, the, uh, the goal to establish and support archives that move away from the custodial model of the GLAM, inst of GLAM institutions, moving away and decentralizing that and, and moving towards uh, living archives that are sustained on country for communities. Um, and, and localized um, accessible collections. Um, but also our priorities always come back to as well, this long-term focus on archive and information professions um, and, and educational pathways, uh, looking at how uh, archive and information studies can be reformed to deliver, to deliver on those priorities that indigenous people and communities have, but also the priorities of indigenous information professionals uh, and GLAM professionals that are working in the sector or will be working in the sector in the future. Um, and I know that this is meant to be a really short intro um, and I've rambled, but um, one of those projects that uh, that we've been working on, we work have been working closely with uh, the Cooter Girls Aboriginal Corporation, which is a community organization that supports survivors of the Cootamundra Girls Home. And um, we've been working with them to identify accessible, usable and community driven and created uh, language resources that can be um, that can support the language journey of survivors of the Kudamundra Girls Home, their descendants and their families. So I've been working closely We've been all of us have been working closely with Megan Jared, who's a well and Gomorrah woman, Camilla woman from the Kudamundra Girls uh, uh, organization and also a community member. Um, and we've been considering what the needs are of the Cuda Girls uh, community around uh, priorities for language learning or engaging with languages or sharing languages. Um, and, and that community group of the Cuda Girls network is uh, representative of uh, 12 different language groups. So it became really apparent um, during that process um, across the planning and the audit and the curation, which is still ongoing, um, that there was a lot of language data out, Indigenous language data out there, but there were, when it came down to it, when we were, when we were putting that against the, the specific needs of the Kuda Girls community, um, there were a few accessible, usable and appropriate resources um, that we could, we could pull together in the end. Um, so the greatest priority uh, in that project was uh, community supported and driven um, uh, resources. And I think, yeah, we've, well, a lot of us have been coming back to, to, to bringing this uh, conversation around, obviously this is co-designed. Co so, um, but I thought that for us, the strength of the project was really in that we were working, one of the strengths is that we were working on this smaller scale. We were working with, Cuda Girls or for the Cuda Girls community. So um, I, I found that that was the strength um, there. But I'm going to stop <laughs> and hand it back to Kirsten or hand it back to someone else. Thank you, Lauren and uh, Kirsten, for your um, linking in. Um, I We'll open it up to questions, but before we go to the floor, I want to go to questions that are coming in virtually just in case, because we missed one previous. Oh, sorry, Clint, do you have, Nick, you have Ned, you'll say? No. How come that happened? I'll oh, shut up and get off, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'd like to also um, pay my respects to Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation where I live and work. Um, I want to talk really quickly about two projects, and the first of them is Ningan, which is a project that's uh, funded by the ARC, and it sort of comes from work that Clint uh, discussed and Clint was doing. Um, but also, I worked on the Noongar native title claim. I was the linguist in the Noongar native title claim. And if you've been close to the native title process, you'll know that it's vaguely sickening. Um, how it works and how little comes out of it. But one of the things that doesn't come out of it is a lot of research materials that are sucked into the native title process but then disappear. 
And I saw that happening there and I thought I could work with one of the, the, pro, the, the really important sets of materials that were used there, which was the Daisy Bates collection, which is in the National Library. And so I took one section of the Daisy Bates papers, 26,000 pages of papers, which are paper. They're in the Batty Library, the Barsmith Library, the National Library, but on paper. And I thought, well, what if we digitise this? What if we put it into text and make it findable and accessible? And I did that. It took about eight years to do that because it was only pieced together with bits and pieces of funding and a lot of negotiation with the National Library, obviously, in doing that. But it's a great project. Um, I didn't co-design it. I designed it. But I took it back for road shows through um, Aboriginal communities in Western Australia once it was in good shape and got very positive feedback for it because people had always tried to grapple with these materials and finally they were able to search them and use them and download them and, and reuse them for language projects and so on. So that led me to think of a, a platform where this could be done for many different um, languages and that's what got us to Ningan and that Ningan is a word for echidna in, the, in Noongar that um, Clint devised for us and and then Roma Winmar approved. And Roma, that's right. So it's, and then we, we applied for ARC leaf funding. We didn't get it the first time we applied. We applied again and got it. We have an Aboriginal steering committee which is very strong in, in leading the project. Uh, we have uh, Aboriginal CIs, CI, um, Clint is one of them. And the idea is that we have as many manuscripts of uh, Indigenous languages as possible, clear the copyright, clear the Indigenous uh, cultural protocols and get those materials into Ningan so that they're then accessible uh, for people to work with. And these are really going back to the earliest records which are often the records people look to in revitalisation projects. That's one project. The other one is Paradisic. So Paradisic is a project that's been going for 20 years. It was established because a number of researchers in Australia recognised that there were tape recordings in Australia of languages of the Pacific, Papua New Guinea, Southeast Asia, that were not being looked after. They weren't part of the job of the National Film and Sound Archive, National Library or, or National Archives. So they were sitting in people's offices or deceased estates and we started getting those recordings and digitising them. Again, we had ARC linkage infrastructure uh, funding for that and we slowly started digitising these tapes. And that was 20 years ago. We've now digitised around 7,000 hours of tapes in about 1,300 different languages, mainly from the region outside Australia, but we do also now contain Australian materials as well. Uh, totaling, so we've digitised 7,000 hours, but we've got born digital of another 7,000, almost 15, 000, over 15,000 hours of material. So it's a significant collection, but from the point of view of the data commons, in Australia, we don't have a research data place. We have storage all over the place, but we don't have a place like... So Paradisec provides metadata, it provides licensing, um, and it provides access to the broader community. So it's not looking inwards to the academic community, but they're always able to use it. But it's really doing outreach. We're going out to agencies in the Pacific, we're getting tapes from the agencies in the Pacific and digitising them for them, because again, nobody's helping them do that and returning the materials to them. And we're also returning materials on Raspberry Pis for local Wi-Fi transmitters and hard disks and all this kind of things. So we're looking at how to make this as accessible as possible using the language codes that Des was talking about, which really does change the accessibility of this stuff because you're not looking for one language name or another language name, you're looking for the code. Um, so all of that kind of infrastructure we need for all research in Australia. So I think we're modelling that in Paradisec, but uh, we need to extend that. So through the Language Data Commons, we'll be able to be looking into collections like Ningan, like Paradisec, and all the access conditions and everything are all sorted out. And then when people come into those collections, they know what they can look at, they know who to ask for uh, access to these things, and they can get access. They don't have to wait for somebody, um, you know, a researcher to die to get access to the materials. They don't have to go knocking on the door of their office to see if they can get that material out of their filing cabinet. So, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Nick, I must ask to confess to you, I was sitting there thinking the, uh, through this panel conversation and I was thinking, geez, I can't think of what Nick said. It must... And I, I listened intently to each of each of you present, and I said, "What did Nick say?" And I said, "But you didn't say nothing." But, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your contribution. My apologies. It just goes to show that we don't get things right all the time. So it's a learning exercise as we evolve forward. At this point, I also want to just 
draw to attention that when we talk about Indigenous language, uh, the conversation thus far has predominantly sort of, I've got the sense that it's been very mainland focused. And I'm conscious of my deadly little sister over there. We need to go beyond the Cape into the Torres Straits, yeah? And we need to go to Duwan, Saibai, Boigu, Erab, all those places too, and recognise that on Thursday Island was Korag, yeah? So there's an extension beyond the mainland that needs to be considered. So you're not forgotten, sister? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, Leah, are there any questions that come from the virtual whatever it is? Yes, yeah, so we do have one question from Emmett at the University of Queensland. He's asked, uh, is that Ningan revisualization, revitalization, sorry, digitalization platform a type of citizen science project? Something amateurs could volunteer to support digitising these resources. Good luck with that. Um, yeah, so we use Digivol, which is the Atlas of Living Australia's crowdsourcing transcription system, and we put manuscripts into there. Of course, the manuscripts have to be cleared in some way, and we have an um, indemnity statement saying, you know, you can't use these for anything else, but it's extremely successful. So they have a crowd. The, the hard thing with crowdsourcing is finding the crowd, and Digivol have done that. So we put manuscripts in there, we get them transcribed very quickly, and then we can put them into the Ningan platform. So Ningan is a platform which accepts different kinds of transcript formats. If you've already transcribed documents in Microsoft Word, there's a way to get them into the Ningan platform as well. So yes, it is including crowdsourcing. Are there any questions from the floor? That. Don't be shy. Just behind you first. Um, I had a question about that's been in my mind um, for a while now. Um, we ha uh, I have a daughter, and we don't belong to this country originally, okay. uh, ethnically. Um, in her school and all the other schools that um, we have looked at, there is no indigenous language offered mm -hmm. for study. Is this, um, is there a reason for this? <laughs> <laughs> because I have come across so many different foreign languages offered at schools, primary schools, secondary mm. schools, but there is not a single one offering indigenous language. Anyone on the panel want to address that? I've got my own view, but... You know, okay. um, look, part of the thing is, uh, with community languages, um, I think Sandra or, or Rose might have mentioned before about um, needing to build it up, that language knowledge in the community, and so some communities might decide, well, we don't want it taught in the community, in that school space just yet. Others, um, we want our, want our community be, to be strong with it, but there are... I think about 35, 40 schools across Queensland that are doing language work. So I'm involved with about 12, 15 of them out southwest. The, um, it comes down to working, the school providing a space, a safe cultural space for teaching that language and having that, that partnership, that conversation with, uh, with community to get language started. So um, Gungri Language Program started 20 years ago, just after I left the education department. That was actually one of my first jobs in my consultancy. They had a principal who finally let Auntie Irene come into the room and have a... Because every, every time there'd be a new principal, Auntie Irene would knock on the door, I want to teach language and culture in the school. Can I do that? 2002, finally got a principal, said, yep, come on in, Auntie, let's have a cup of tea. Over that cup of tea, and a couple of, teas, a couple of pots later, we'd, they um, asked me to come out and put all of that thinking into a language framework so that it fitted in with the Queensland Education Department curriculum and then later on I revised it to suit the national curriculum. So it, it really just started with that conversation and it really needs to be owned and managed and driven by the community. The, a, a lot of schools have their good intention and the goodwill but they're worried about, okay, well, who, who's the right pe people to talk to? Who's the, the right person, the proper person to, to teach that language? So there's, there is some material around on the Queensland uh, Curriculum Assessment Authority and also the ACARA about how to, how to start that conversation. And so there is an ACARA curriculum, Australian Curriculum for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Languages um, curriculum framework. And Doug Marmion in the audience here is one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, writers of that. So a lot of work went into that. 
And so it's a great framework and the idea of that framework is for the school to sit down with the community and work out what language content goes into that framework, how is it going to be taught? Yeah. Can I ask a question back to you? Where are you from originally? What part? Bombay. How do we say uh, good afternoon, good morning to you? Shub Sakal. Yeah. And, and if you were further north, say Punjab, we say Shukriya, Danivad. No, they would say, say, um, they would say something Yeah. There's an interesting story. Nick, did you want to have a response to why language isn't taught in schools? Terribly racist society in which <laughs> Aboriginal culture has been demeaned for so long that um, most people don't think a, a worthy object of study or, or teaching. I think that, I'm sorry, but I think that's probably the reason. Yep. We're still a way to go yet, sister. Mm. But you're very welcome in this country, you need to know that, <laughs> as is your daughter. There's a lot of work being done around it, but it falls short because uh, English is always given prominence because it opens doors to you. And Hindi, which is a common language is uh, in India, is it opens a different set of doors to you as well. So parents actually encourage their children to learn these other languages. And it's the native languages are spoken very rarely. We try our best with our own child to speak our native language, but it is a struggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Australia is a different, different set of circumstances, unfortunately, sister. I've worked in language um, projects up in the Torres Strait for many, many years now. And um, just your question in regards to the curriculum, I just uh, got back from Gama, um, had the privilege of being up there and amongst all the other um, announcements up there, uh, Senator Linda Burney announced that um, they will be embedding um, First Nations languages into the curriculum around Australia um, to about maybe 40 schools at first, I think, to start off with. Um, so that's going to become compulsory as well. So that was really welcoming news. Um, so there was a lot of focus on language because, as we know, um, language is the core of who we are. It identifies us. It's our very being. You know, we need language in our lives um, to be able to move full circle now um, with our culture. And um, in saying that, um, in the Torres Strait, we do embed language in our curriculum. Um, we have done so for many, many years. There has been a bit of challenge there though. A um, couple of my grandfathers and uncle who were um, language speakers at the Dana Oba and um, the late uncle Dimple Adi Dimple Bani, they did a lot of work with the school um, in regards to setting up that curriculum. And after they retired, um, all the work that they had done, the education department basically said to them, that's our copyright. And because they went on then to become consultants, you know, in their own business, and they weren't allowed to use any of the content that they had developed for the education department for our children to learn, which was very, very sad um, that those, you know, this was the other way around copyright now with education. So they, I'm hoping in, for in the future, they find a middle ground so that, you know, our, our families that come in to teach uh, and develop um, curriculum um, in education, high school or primary school, they have the right to that IP, because that's their word. I mean, it belongs to everybody. Um, and they, you know, basically had to create a whole new um, set of work so that they could uh, work as consultants independently. So I just wanted to say then thank you to everybody um, who's been on the panel. It's been wonderful to be here. And 
um, get all this information. That, yeah, it, is, it has been an issue in the past with the Education Department about copyright and, and IP protection and, and that uh, they've, they've been doing some work with uh, Terry Janke uh, and her group and putting some, some I guess, more surety um, and certainty for community, particularly when people such as, as, as Dana and others up there in the Torres Strait who've, who've done all that work for, for the Education Department and, and um, it... it yeah, previously anything done for the department belonged to the department and so fortunately there's been a big shift in that and I don't think it's been actually uh, formally released yet but it should be coming out very soon and it's, it's very clear and it's very much aligned with, with a lot of Terry's work around that use of language, that, that moral obligations that we've, we've um, heard this morning as well, that IP, that um, the copyright protection around their full community members and those language workers as well. We have one other question up front before. Mine was just a quick one, and I guess it goes to both um, Nick and to Clint, but it's about your project-based work. I mean, I know that the life story, a little bit of, of paradisic, but the work you're doing at the moment, you call it a project. Is it, does it have a life, you know, and, and its funding horizon? What does that look like, and how does it sustain? Because it sounds an amazing piece of work project is as far as I see it is is the development of a tool which is you know got it's like a Swiss army knife really all of these different things you can you can throw at archival language material and it's it's dependent on communities wanting to use those tools and to determine how those tools are used so if we've got lang someone's language written down you know basic word list handwritten there's not a lot you can do with it it sits in an archive somewhere Okay, so first step is we can digitise it so more people can get access to it. Who? Well, that's up to what the community says. And then it's like, well, we can use these tools to um, convert that handwritten text into um, digital text. Or we can do crowdsourcing and get, get people all involved, can just be community people, can be the whole world involved in typing that up. So we've got all these different tools that we can use to... to process that, that language material to get it to a point where it's more useful for communities. And that's all community directed, community to community. But the tool can be used for any language or any material really. And then once all that's done, I mean our project's funded for what, another couple of years? And then IATSIS, the Aboriginal, um, or the Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, um, is going to be the, um, the custodian of that that tool, like the material is still going to reside in the collections that it resides in now, but that means of hosting it in this other way, IATSIS will take charge of, and as we know, IATSIS is funded into the future, and Doug Marmion's there, and, and uh, Sharon Davis there, I'm looking at you, and I'm deputy chair until uh, 2025, so at least until 2025 I'm going to be pushing for that, um, but that's IATSIS's role, it's the backstop, you know. And ideally, we've been talking about, you know, diversifying community access to collections and where collections are held. All that's really tricky because collections themselves can be really um, ephemeral things. They can be pieces of paper that if they're in the wrong place, and it's just like even talking to, you know, friends I got from up your way, you know, there's this very real threat of climate change. And, you know, if you've got an archive that's on an island and the sea rises, well, you know, so we need those backstops. We need to think about that. But then we also need access. And that's where this digital stuff can be useful. Um, but then it comes to, well, where's the server? Where's the backup for the server? IATSIS has solved a lot of those problems in terms of our digital infrastructure. Um, but it's about getting that community access um, happening. So that's those local access portals. IATSIS is opening a facility. Are we allowed to announce that? We're now to, we, that's been announced, eh? Hey? The um, Alice thing. That's been announced. We've opened a facility in Alice Springs. Well, we're opening a facility in Alice Springs. And, but what we want to see is that diversity of community access hubs, but then also some people got personal access, but a lot of people I know got a phone, got no credit. How are you going to get access to that digital infrastructure? So we need to think really hard about that equity of access. So it's on that first, that equity at that first level in terms of how is community informing what's happening, 
but then there's that equity at the end of the line where how is community actually getting access to this in a sustainable way? And that goes back to those base issues of, you know, poverty, disenfranchisement, all that education system, all that, all those issues. Big ecosystem. Nick. Can I just add on to that? So uh, from a technical point of view, um, one of the things we've seen a lot is people using content management systems that are owned by some company and they put their stuff into it and then they can't get it out. So what we're doing with this platform is building a way so that the platform exists but each piece of data, each manuscript, has its own metadata with it, stored together with it, and that has the access conditions and everything, licensing information with it. So each of those things can exist separate from the platform so that they can then be stored in different places they could go to community archives in, in local places and they can use them because they've got all of their metadata with them. So they're not just files that are going out there and you're saying what's on these files, but they're actually described. If they've got transcripts, the transcripts are with them as well. So this is really looking at what a data commons looks like technically and how we can build that. So Ningan is sort of fitting into that as well. Thank you, Nick. And um, I acknowledge IATSIS as being one entity that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people trust. That's an important recognition. Um, whether they've got it all right is yet to be determined, but they're, they're obviously doing what they have to do. Um, from a library, an archive, a gallery point of view, do you have the same level of trust is a, th a thing to think about. And why, do, why does an IATSIS have trust at this level when your trust it might be here or you might have better, I don't know. There's a whole host of questions that'll come up in the context of round table discussions. Um, if you've got questions, feel free to ask people at little lunch. Um, we'll have a 15 minute little lunch because I want to get back on time. And <clears throat> I thank the panel members for your contribution thus far. Um, we're just peeling back the layers. <laughs>